Hey, Facebook, uh, social media, thanks for tuning in. I'm sitting here with Tony. And uh, Tony is a, a surrogate in the state of Iowa, and her case has been all over the news. And she and I have been in uh, contact for about a year now. We were just discussing, it's been about a year since she reached out to me. So welcome, Tony, and I'm glad to have you um, being willing to be interviewed with me. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so we were talking, uh, maybe tell people first how you, how you came to find me. I don't know if it was just a search on Facebook. Um, I found the Stop Surrogacy Now on Facebook, and I, I think I sent an email, um, and you responded to me. I think I sent you a bunch of emails yeah. <laughs> at one time. It, it was like a bunch of, I think, more of a, a, an outcry for help, basically, yeah. find, trying to find someone to talk to. Yeah, because the nature of your case and the complexity of the legal battle, you were really not able to be free in talking about what, what you're going through. Not at all. Yeah, so you were looking for a, a listening ear, which I'm happy that for the last year I, I've been pretty good about picking up your calls and texts and letting you, as you like to say, vent. Yeah. <laughs> so, anyway, the first question is, um, why did you decide to be a surrogate? It was kind of like a, a spur of the moment type of a decision. Uh, my husband and I, um, thought the only way we could have kids was through IVF. And, you know, when I thought about it, I was like, okay, maybe we can do IVF for another couple. And in turn, they can pay for our IVF cycle. Yeah. Which that's a and very, that's, go ahead. That, that's why, that's yeah. why I went the route that I did. And that's kind of a common thing in the United Kingdom. They talk about, um, egg sharing, you know, if you'll help another woman have a baby, then that will help your reduce your costs because this is very expensive technology. So you and your husband had your own infertility problems and you thought, well, if we can help this couple and they will compensate us and we can use that money for our own IVF. Is that right? Yeah, we weren't, yeah, we were just going to go to the same clinic yeah. and it was a significantly reduced amount to go there. It yeah. was only going to be 13000 to use that same clinic. Yeah. So did you actually sign a contract with the intended parents? Uh, yeah, we eventually did. Yeah. And was that through a, the agency or a separate independent lawyer? Oh, we didn't go through an agency. I actually found the intended parents on Craigslist. They were just advertising. Yeah, it's crazy as that sounds right now. Yeah, um, yeah, they were advertising on Craigslist, and, and I answered their ad. And it's my understanding that you carried a child for them that was the genetic child of the intended father, but that there was an egg donor that was used. Correct. Correct, because of the the intended mother had some issues with her own fertility. Right. Yeah. So, did you get pregnant on the first uh, transfer with this couple? Yes. And, you, uh -huh. and how did the pregnancy go? Was, as far as risk, was it a complicated pregnancy or? No, um, n no, not, not at all. Um, I mean, I only went six months, but I, w I went to all the doctor's appointments. Nothing was wrong. And there was some bleeding in the beginning that I heard as common and normal. Um, it was a multiple pregnancy. I was pregnant with twins. Mm -hmm. And um, so I had a subcom subcom sub chorionic hemorrhage in the beginning and um, that's the only thing that happened everything else was fine yeah and what happened at six months you said everything was fine until six months I went into preterm labor yeah and you delivered a cesarean or cesarean and was it a scheduled cesarean or was it an emergency kind of a situation tell me about emergency that. it was an emergency because I yeah they tried to stop the labor they couldn't yeah and so and, you deliver twins? Yes. Twin boys, girls? Twin girls. Yeah. And, and how were they at birth? Um, very low birth weight. It was 25 weeks that I delivered. Um, and we lost one eight days later. They were girls? Both girls? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. When in the pregnancy did things kind of go sideways, if you will, with the intended parents? As soon as we got word that I was pregnant. 
Wow. I, I, immediately, as soon as we got word that I was pregnant. And, and tell me, describe what, what went wrong, what happened. I was immediately told that I should be saying yes, ma'am, to the intended mother. Um, I was told that my husband could no longer be in the hospital rooms uh, with me. Um, I was told that I had to get permission if I wanted to go to the hospital, if I was bleeding. Um, she was actually upset with me because I went to the ER because I was bleeding. Um, and that wasn't my place to do that. They hired me. Um, it was my duty to inform them of everything I did. And I had to get permission from them. Um, when it got to that point where she told me I needed to start saying yes, ma'am, to her, um, she told me I was crazy. Uh, she said I came from a horrible background, and I, I was just floored because everything was perfect up to that point. And I, I had stated at that time I could no longer talk to her, and that I, I needed to talk to the attendant father because it was his his sperm. <laughs> Maybe I needed to talk to him. And that didn't work either. So, so he wasn't more reasonable? No. No, he's actually the one that said my husband could no longer be in the hospital room with, with me. And so at that point, I said there was, I couldn't talk to either one of them that we needed to go through attorneys. And we had to go find an attorney. Yeah, and then it's my understanding, because this is in print and some news articles, and that you were recently, you know, in Washington, D.C. at a press briefing, which, which repeated that you and your husband were called some pretty derogatory um, names by the intended parents. That, that was what put the icing on the cake, so to speak. Um, we dealt with weeks of being harassed. Um, it got to the point where I, I couldn't, I, I didn't feel comfortable leaving in my house. Uh, when we left our house, we were followed. We had notes left on our cars. Um, my husband had to get a second job. They were stalking him at a second job. Um, they were contacting people in our family. And when I say in our family, I mean even my mother-in-law's ex-husband's daughter. They were going through trying to contact people in our family. Um, we went on vacation. Somebody tried to break into our house. Um, one of our cars almost blew up on my house. It was crazy. So even with all that, I still was going to give the babies to them. Um, what made me decide that I said I, I could no longer do that was um, the attendant father sent my sister-in-law a message via Facebook saying that he didn't realize her brother was a dirty effing Mexican and they didn't want him here. Mm -hmm. And then a couple days after that, she called me the N-word on the phone. Yeah. So, um, you know, we get a lot of pushback from using the term breeder, uh, you know, the name of our surrogacy film that we made a few years ago. Uh, but, it, you know, when I hear stories like yours, um, I kind of say, well, case in point, here is an example of a woman who was treated as if she was a paid breeder. You work for us. We hired you to do a job. And like you say, you know, you had to ask permission uh, for almost every single action that you did. So I'm really, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, and then, of course, you had to get legal representation and your, your case in a very short period of time, it probably seems like a long period of time to you as you've been living in this hell, but you know, your, your case went to the Iowa Supreme Court, right? Yeah. And, and what was the, what were you asking the Iowa Supreme Court to do? Basically to make the contract, not enforce the contract. And um, at the time, the law in Iowa books was you can't enforce that contract because Technically, we all would have been committing a Class C felony for selling a human, for selling a child. Um, Iowa, at the time, had laws in the books, exceptions for surrogates. I was not a surrogate. I was a gestational carrier. So our act, what we were doing, was actually selling a child. And what did the Supreme Court um, rule in your case? That the contract was enforceable, um, but not they didn't they didn't touch on all of it. it it's it, I don't know <laughs> to be honest with you. I don't know what they're what they're thinking, what they're doing. That um, that now 
the contracts that these kind of contracts can be enforced in the state of Iowa. But still, there's still some parents that have to go through the adoption process. So I don't, you know, it was stated in my contract that my husband and I had to voluntarily give up our rights. Um, and that way the attendant mother could adopt and that the attendant father can go on the birth certificate. We didn't do that. So if they enforce part of the contract but not all of it, that's what I don't understand. We didn't voluntarily give up our rights. Yeah, and so the Iowa Supreme Court recognizes both the intended parents as the, yeah. no, just the father? Just okay. the father. As the, she still has to go through the adoption I process, see. the Got intended it. mother. Yeah, right. Good. And then um, perhaps your case will make its way to the highest, you know, the highest court in the land, the U.S. Supreme Court, um, challenging, if you will, the constitutionality of these kinds of contracts. So it's been a nightmare for you, you and your husband, and your and your family. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. And it's all destroyed our family. Yeah. And of course, you regret. Um, all of this, you know, you can't take it back. But, you know, f for people who are listening um, to this interview, which we hope many people will, uh, if you could speak to a young woman who's considering perhaps being a surrogate to help somebody or a couple who's thinking about hiring a surrogate, well, what would you want to say to them? Not to do it. Um... And I see a lot of people um, saying comments like, well, these women know what they were doing when they signed the contract. You have to understand, um, I, I signed a piece of paper before I got pregnant. I signed a piece of paper before I knew the character of these attendant parents. Um, it was my duty to protect these kids. Um, you can't say we knew what we were doing of course we knew what we were doing mm -hmm. and we still know what we're doing that's why we're going the next step that we're going it's not right you i mean you because you marry somebody you think you're in love with that person and it doesn't work out do you, you're supposed to stay in it or let's talk about the kids if I, years later, saw something happen to baby H, I would never be able to forgive myself. And then would people blame me for not protecting her? I couldn't, I would not do it. I don't think, I think there's plenty of kids out there that can be adopted. I understand the want of having your own biological child, but as the court says, these kids were not my biological children, and I was still willing and able to fight for kids that weren't biologically mine because that's what I was supposed to do. It was my moral duty to protect them. Yeah, and you know, our organization works to stop surrogacy. Um, we are up against those who overwhelmingly will admit that surrogacy can be fraught with all kinds of problems or can be health complications or can be ethical problems. And so those people say, well, we can just regulate those away um, to protect everybody. But I think here again is an example of a case where what kind of regulations would protect baby H? Right. Um, you know, uh, perhaps you could do better screening of intended parents. I don't know, but you still can't always know, even though you screen people, that doesn't, mean, there's a lot of people that just can put on a good face and present themselves <laughs> as fine, upstanding human beings, um, but really not be that, you know, that kind of character in reality. So, well, well, I, I don't know. Do you have anything else you want to, you know, tell people that are listening in that I haven't asked you about? Um, I, I, I just, you know, I, I the fact that a lot of people are blaming a surrogate for, I don't know if this is like a, a, if this is some way that people are thinking we're trying to stop people from making money or, um, but the only thing I will say, it, it, until it happens to you, yeah. until you go through something myself or some of the other surrogates that you see out there that have some of these horrific stories, you can't possibly imagine what we go through. I've been silenced for almost two years. 
and I still have to think about if she's going to be okay. The only thing I could do is pray that they're going to take care of her and not bring her up in a house full of hate, you know? No. This wasn't a money or a quick get rich scheme type thing because if that was the case, it would have been more for thir- more than thirteen thousand dollars. We just wanted one cycle of IVF that they haven't done anything. No. And um, I just I think surrogate sh- surrogacy should be stopped. You guys can hate me for saying that. I'm I'm strong, as you can see. I've been quiet for two years. I can take it, but that's where I stand. Um, if you think about doing it, I understand your heart might be in a good place. It's not worth the chance of going through what me and so many others that I found out since have gone through. Yeah, it's not worth it. And, and you and then you to bring com- these little kids into it. To commend you because you have been incredibly brave. Because um, you you know that you will now that you're putting your your story out there. You've been silenced, which has been frustrating, because the intended parents and the lawyers and the media have been able to present one side or their side with you not being able to say, "Hey, wait a minute." And now that you are speaking out, you know that you're going to be um, attacked. You know that you'll be called names. Um, so, you know, the bravery, it can't, any, it can't be any worse than what the attendant parents have already done. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. they have, they have tried to drag my name through the rough mud. It's, it can't be any worse. I'm, you know, it doesn't bother me. Right. Right. You know, it and, doesn't bother me do... because I know why I did what I did. The reason why I was doing it. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you went into, like you say, knowing what you were going to do, but having no idea, um, how what the outcome was going to be yeah which you can't predict none of us can we don't have crystal balls so anyway i thank you so much for um telling your story and we're happy to continue to support women like you and and tell you and remind you that you're not nuts (laughs) when some days you think am i the crazy one here um and so uh, to stand with you and hopefully to demand justice, not only for you, but also for this little this little girl. Yeah. Um, and to work together to stop surrogacy. So. I'm ready for it. Thank you. Thank you.